topic. Today we'll be discussing on low immunophenotyping of uh, B acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So before I start, let me tell you, like this particular session is not very specific to B acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I have made it more generalized. Um, so it would be like for most acute leukemias, it will be... Uh, so it will be towards most acute leukemia. So the present, the, the initial part of this discussion will be more uh, to acute leukemia, and then I'll go very specifically for BAL. So initial slides will be a generalized one for all acute leukemias. So without wasting much time, let's start. Right. So not much of theory because uh, I don't have time. I'll be discussing more on flow. But still, uh, just an introduction. So, B acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a neoplasm of uh, precursor cells committed to B cell lineage, right? So, it has two types of presentation. One is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where the predominant presentation is uh, in the blood and marrow, where you where you find the blast. And second is lymphoblastic lymphoma, where there is a tissue involvement, where you find a neoplasm or a mass. Okay, <clears throat> and. Uh, as you all know, PLL is more common type of cancer in children. Okay, so this this we discussed in the last class. What is the role of flow cytometry in acute leukemias? So basically, we do flow for diagnosing leukemias, acute leukemias, and uh, we identify the disease, diagnosis, quantification of the blast or the neoplastic cells, and then the lineage assignment to the blast. Okay. So, flow helps in diagnosis, quantification of the disease or the uh, blast, and then lineage assess assignment to the blast. Okay, And as I said to you, the blast percentage by morphology and the blast percentage in flow cytometry may not go hand in hand always. So, there may be a bit of disparity between the blast percentage what you get by morphology and the blast percentage what you get by flow cytometry. Okay, So, blast may be low in flow because of hemodilution okay so normally what happens is as you all know the first pull marrow will be very good and representative okay the subsequent pulls if they are taking from the same area it will lead to hemodilution it will lead to hemodilution okay and that is the reason why we always tell the clinician when you are submitting the sample for minimal residual disease detection mrd we want the clinician to give the first pull to flow cytometry because the disease or the blast will be very, very few in number. And if he's going to take the first pull for morphology to put the slides, and then he's going to take the subsequent aspirates for MRD, it can be false negative. Okay. So in diagnostic, of course, we would love to take a first pull, but even the subsequent pulls may not be a problem because the marrow will be loaded with blast or the abnormal cells. So even the second pull or third pull, of course, the number of blast may be low, but still you could make the diagnosis. But in minimal residual disease detection, we always tell them kindly give us the first pull for flow to detect the residual disease because the blast itself will be less than 1%. And if he's going to use that first pull for making slides and the subsequent pulls gets diluted with blood, it may not be... Uh, estimating the disease correctly or it can be negative also, false negative also. So that is one reason where the blast percentage can be low in flow cytometry compared to morphology or sometimes the blast percentage in flow will be more than morphology. That is because of the non-classic morphology of the blast and uh, during flow processing we lose a lot of nucleated some nucleated erythroids and that may relatively increase the percentage of blast. So if you ask me which is the best way to establish the percentage of blast, I would say, yes, morphology with the help of flow. Okay, so morphology is better, but still there are certain areas, morphology can give you a low blast count, um, so, or a high blast count. So the other important use of flow cytometry in uh, leukemia uh, is classification. Okay, though by morphology, we suspect a lymphoblastic leukemia, we want to know whether it is a B lymphoblastic leukemia or a T lymphoblastic leukemia. In B, you can again subtype it into, as we discussed, pro-BALL, pre-BALL, color positive, and so on. So in classification also, flow is very useful. 
Sometimes the phenotype given by the flow cytometry can help you to predict the genotype. Okay, one example we discussed the last class is BALL with CD10 negativity. Okay, so any BALL with CD10 negativity coming in infants can likely to harbor a MLL gene rearrangement or KMT2A gene rearrangement. And these cases have a relatively poorer prognosis. So phenotype can also help in genotype correlation. Similarly, APML. Okay. So, and similarly, there is acute myeloid leukemia with 821 translocation, which gives a signature phenotype. I don't want to discuss that now. Uh, during AML session, we'll discuss that. And the other advantages by flow, you can also just stratify the disease. As I said, a MLL gene rearranged BAL has a relatively bad prognosis compared to a typical Kala positive BAL. Okay. So, it also helps in risk stratification. And selection of proper treatment. So now everything we know about um, uh, um, cell therapy and monoclonal antibody therapy. So flow, flow cytometry can help you to determine the expression of antigens which you want to target. Okay, in targeted therapy. For example, if you want to give anti-CD19 therapy for BAL, by flow you can see whether the blast, how well the CD19 is expressed in the blast. So that is also very very useful in flow cytometry. Okay, similarly, rutiximab, which is an anti-CD20, okay, in lymphomas. So, you can see the expression of these markers by flow cytometry, okay. Then, follow-up and assessment of response. This is more related to minimal residual disease detection, okay. So, after giving an induction therapy, you can see whether the blast has subsequently decreased or it is still persisting, okay. So, that is a very important uh, advantage also. So, these are the... Um, indications why flow has to be done in acute leukemia and we saw this last class but i just repeated it because it's important now coming to immunophenotyping of acute leukemia the samples what you receive may be a peripheral blood okay um, if the peripheral blood is leukopenic at most of the time sometimes uh, the marrow may not be attempted by the clinician and he may ask you to run flow in peripheral blood if the blast percentage is good in number, say for example 40%, 50%, 60% or more and uh, the total count is also good in number, then you can directly take up the sample of 2 ml peripheral blood start processing for flow. Sometimes the patient may be pancytopenic. Okay, At that time you suggest them to do a bone marrow but still due to some reasons if they are not doing the bone marrow and the blast percentage is around say for example 5% or 6% with a good total count or the total count is too low say 1,500 or 1,000 cells per microliter, then you need to take extra volume of blood, lyse it so that you achieve the numbers which you want to acquire or the cells what you want to analyze, okay? Bone marrow, sorry for the spelling error, bone marrow is a other very, very common sample what we receive for flow cytometry. Rarely we do receive body fluids, most commonly pleural fluid in T lymphoplastic lymphoma when it is involving the pleural cavity. Because T, uh, T lymphoplastic lymphoma commonly has a mass in the mediastinum, right? And it can also infiltrate the pleural space and the T, lymph T lymphoid blast may be there in the pleural fluid. And uh, pleural fluid may be sent for immunophenotyping. And CSF may be sent more commonly in a B lymphoplastic leukemia, which is involving the CNS, okay? Then you may get lymph node aspirates and you can also get tissues when... The lymphoblastic, uh, when it is a lymphoblastic lymphoma occupying a tissue, okay. So, processing and data acquisition. So, we know the samples what we accept for flow cytometry is either the additives uh, accepted are EDTA and heparin, okay. EDTA will preserve the sample for 48 hours, heparin can preserve for 72 hours. And processing part we have discussed, uh, like uh, people who have attended basics may know, so processing can be done by two methods. One is stain lace wash technique the other is lice stain wash technique so normally we process samples for flow cytometry by two methods when it is a qualitative assay that is like leukemia lymphoma so it's stain lice wash is where you stain the cells with antibodies first then you lyse the rbcs you wash and acquire the other method is you lyse the rbcs first then stain the cells with antibodies wash and then you acquire so these are the two processing techniques um, and flow cytometer for leukemia lymphoma, as I said, it should be desirable more than 8 color. So, it's not a very good idea to do a leukemia lymphoma immunophenotyping in a 4 color or a 6 color instrument. Not uh, so great about it. So, it, it's better you use an 8 color instrument 
for doing of immunophenotyping of leukemias and lymphomas. Okay, so how many events you want to acquire? So what is an event is all you should know. Event is uh, one particular cell in a scatter plot in a flow cytometry. We call it as event. So you have to acquire around 50,000 events or more than that. I would say one lakh is the optimal or the sufficient one for a diagnostic flow cytometry. So I am discussing here about diagnostic. That is a patient presenting with leukemia where you find blast. Okay, in biomorphology, first time. Then you can acquire around 50,000 or 1 lakh events or uh, uh, 1 lakh cells for diagnostic phenotyping. During MRD, that is after treatment, the blast percentage may fall very um, low. At that time, 50,000 and 1 lakh will not be sufficient to find that low number of blast. So you need to acquire larger number of events, around like 1.5 million events, okay, which is 15 lakhs. Okay. And uh, analysis, you can do it by software. So uh, we use different, different software. I use Kaluza software. Some people use Fax Diva. Uh, so we have softwares which are available for analyzing the data. Okay. Now, any doubts? Any doubts? Am I clear? If things are clear, someone type as uh, clear in chat box. I want to know whether uh, people are following. Yes, sir. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Nah? Super. So, uh, sir, one doubt for CSF uh, for doing flow. Mm. Anything special to be? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, CSF, if you are doing flow, do it as fast as possible. Once it's collected, do, uh, ask them to transport to the laboratory as early as possible first. Second point, if it's going to get delayed, there's something called RPMI media. People who are working with karyotyping uh, or uh, genetics lab know, know this. It's basically nutrient broth like material which you can add to the CSF if the processing is a bit delayed. Okay. Second point. Third point, before you want to do flow in uh, CSF, just have a look at the cell count and morphology. Okay. So when the cell, though, your, uh, for example, if the cell count is very low, okay, now you need larger volume of CSF, which is not possible because CSF is a very precious fluid. So they may give you around maximum 1 ml or maximum 2 ml, not beyond that, I suppose. So check the cell count. There should be some optimal cell numbers for you to do flow. Say, for example, if the cell count is just 5 cells per microliter, okay, then uh, even uh, using the entire volume of sample which has been sent to you, you may not be able to achieve that optimal amount of events for proper analysis. So that is another point. And uh, also, uh, so uh, this is the slide which I want to say. Whenever you proceed for flow, always have a look at the morphology. Morphology will give you an idea of what you're going to see. And it will uh, uh, give you a clarity of things. Okay. So similarly, CSF, just try to have a look at the morphology. Are really blast are there in the CSF sample? Okay. Just have try to have a look. That is second. And that is the third point. Yes, Fourth excuse point, me, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, can we put a criteria for like accepting the CSF if we have less count of like less than uh, 5 per microliter as you told? We don't have a well-defined criteria here. Okay. See, because like clinicians sometimes they want it like uh, to do. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. You need to tell them. You need to educate them. Saying like, see, um, uh, will you be able to do a flow in a peripheral blood where the total count is less than five hundred cells per microliter? Not possible, right? No. Yes. So, yeah, exactly. So even in CSF, my personal, uh, by my experience, I feel uh, when the CSF count is greater than uh, thirty cells per microliter. Okay, see, again, okay. there is nothing like a hard and fast rule here. Uh, there is no references given like well, this is the cutoff for which you have to accept the sample uh, for flow, I mean, CSF samples for flow. There is no cutoff established. And again, uh, checking the cell count is that again, some people do it properly with new bus chamber. I have seen some labs where the series of being run in cell counters. Normal. Okay, again, uh, when the count is very low, I don't know how, what is the linearity of your cell counters, automated cell counters to give you a correct count. My personal experience is when I see more than 30 or 50 cells, 50 cells per microliter in CSF, okay, I can go ahead with flow. I can able to get a good uh, 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 events acquired and analysis. For analysis, the, uh, it, the plots looks very decent. When it is like only 10 cells or something, now the events get scattered throughout the plot. Then you cannot able to analyze it. So that is my point. So you just have a cell count check. Um, uh, this is by experience. So again, I'm telling you, there is no criteria established anywhere. 
like okay. clinicians like how to satisfy them like how to tell them that it, this this uh, cell count is not okay will they be like uh, no i'll ask you one question have you seen blast in that particular cs of what they are insisting no on no sir but they still <laughs> insist sometimes because uh, already like when they have like uh, leukemia once we had sir uh -huh. one leukemia case after like uh, remission there was uh -huh. no there were no blasts in the cs uh -huh. uh, like peripheral sample but still they uh, had the patient had like uh, all uh, uh, meningitis kind of symptoms uh, 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 uh. so okay. they were strongly suspecting that uh, correct your cns yes. is correct like okay. cns is involved okay. so that time they wanted us to do it and there were no uh. cells actually but uh, we were yeah. forced to do but we did not get anything actually yeah. so yeah. can we know the cell count in this case Like just Sorry? the cell count. Can we just know the cell count in this case yeah. from yeah. Doctor Seema? Yeah, please. Cell count is cell count? less than five only. Uh, but still, they I want would, to go ahead with the cell count. No, no point. No, nah, yeah. I would keep. That's if we are no not point. seeing the cells only, I think we can simply deny yeah. based on that. Yeah. If I, I'll tell you what, you need to educate them. See, uh, even the Seema, right? Nah, first pull marrow. You know yes. how much time it took for people to understand that the first pull marrow has to be submitted for flow for MRD assessment. So it will. You ne we need to educate them and see. Just for satisfying them, if you are doing flow, second time they are going to send to you. And if they discuss with some of your, I I have seen people doing MRD for APML by flow. So these are all we need to educate them. They don't know. We need to tell them and see the waste of antibodies, waste of manpower, so many things. Right, right. So. So my experience is like around thirty cells or fifty cells. Yes, you can do. You can do that too. You need to do a very neat processing, and you can get beautiful uh, plots. I can show you some plots during our analysis. I don't know whether can I do it tomorrow, but I'll definitely before the end of this course I'll show you some CSF with the blast. Okay. So and sir, if you could share your SOP of CSF processing, that will be really. There is good. nothing like CSF processing or uh, uh, blood or marrow processing. It's all the same. Like the only same. Only one thing. Only one, one. Sorry, I tell you what. We need to desperate. We need, sir. Like actually, the method, actual method, how to. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. What are the things that will differ for CSF when compared to blood and marrow? Is no lysing, because CSF will not have much of RBCs there. Correct. Still, if it's an hemorrhagic type, you need to do lysis. Okay? And the concentration may help, sir. Considering the low count yes. of CSF. Yes. 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 You can do that again. You need to. Ah, uh, if the volume is too much. See if it is one ml, uh, it's fine. If the volume is say like they've given you a very good volume, then you can spin. Mm -hmm. Okay, take off yeah. the superintendent, and then you can concentrate. Of course, yes, true. That can be okay. done. That can be done. So yeah. that is one. Thank you. Yeah, and the other point which differs in CSF is uh, in analysis is, of course, you will not be doing lysis. That is the one thing which you need to do, and don't use cytoplasmic markers. Okay, again, it's by my experience. Always make if it's BL, just try to do with surface markers. Some people use uh, TDT. So for TDT again, you need to do fix and permeabilization, correct? So that will alter your cells, and again, you will not get good clustering. So two things: a white lysis step, and make your panel with only surface antibodies, because regularly we also do for MRD surface. It's similar panel is useful. A white TDT that is something which I want to share. Okay, so just going ahead. So better have an idea of a morphology before analyzing flow. Okay, I'll tell you certain examples. And uh, when you see blast, go for an acute leukemia panel. By seeing morphology, you may be a very good morphologist. Now, after seeing the blast, you feel like it's more likely B lymphoid blast. It's a pediatric age group, bone pains, and so and so, no mediastinal mass, and you find you you feel it to be more of B lymphoid because commonly it's B lymphoid. And don't try to run markers restricted to B cell lineage. This will lead to very very bad results. Okay, always have a panel which encompasses B, myeloid, and T. Okay, so since B lymph uh, B A L L is very common, don't try to do only B markers. Yes, but nine out of ten times you will be right, but you are missing an MPAL somewhere. You will be missing an mixed phenotype acute leukemia somewhere. So that is a problem. One. Second, you may be missing aberrancies, which may be helping in detecting the minimal residual disease later. Okay, so always the messages always use a panel i have seen some labs where to conserve antibodies they use very limited panels 
say like sir morphology was looking very lymphoid sir and b is very common sir so i have used only p markers sir what about other markers no sir i am not done. so that is that is very risky don't do that okay so and one more important thing about morphology is by seeing the morphology you know what is the size of the blast what is the internal complexity of the blast are there any vacuoles in the blast are there any granules in the blast so these are all very very important things which morphology gives and even it can give you an approximate percentage of the blast so you know if the blast are good in number you know that the, you, you you can anticipate a good clustering in the plots which you are going to see if the blast are very low in number then you need to have a very 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 good look of getting the blast getting I mean searching the blast so these are very very important points i'll tell you what now see this is a blast beautiful lymphoid blast the cytoplasm is very scanty you don't find any granularity any cytoplasmic uh, complexities okay and the blast as a side scatter so you know side scatter tells you about the internal complexity or the granularity of the cell so the side scatter is very low very similar to the lymphocytes of course if you see the forward scatter it may be greater than the lymphocytes because the size is larger than that of lymphocytes so the forward scatter may be slightly higher but you see the side scatter is very similar to the lymphocytes but when you have a blast like this okay so the blast is having vacuolations so vacuolations when the laser laser hits the blast what happens the lights get scattered now the side scatter is more in these blasts compared to these blast so you find the blast having a higher side scatter here so why i'm saying you so that in fact say, say for example i've not seen the morphology at all i am directly going for analysis okay the blast may have high side scatter and it may be falling here and i'm looking for the blast here i may end up missing the blast or i can quantify only a part of the blast so always have a look at the morphology i tell you one case uh, which happened uh, once we got an uh, leukemia and uh, it was diagnosed and sent for flow from outside we directly told it start the panel so my i suppose my uh, yes my registrar uh, junior consultant or someone who went and said like sir it's looking absolutely normal i'm not finding anything i said like come on it has come from a reputed hospital where they are good at getting the morphology it can't be so then uh, i just asked for the slides it was apml okay all the abnormal promyelocytes having a high side scatter sitting here he was looking only in the low side scatter blast gate or the blast region this area and he found nothing here new lymphocytes some erythroid population this was completely missed so always have a idea of morphology before going to flow that may help you okay but with the experience yes you can directly go for independent immunophenotyping but my advice is always see morphology before going for flow that is uh, as a beginner it's very important okay and forward scatter as you all know is proportional to the size of the blast greater the size of the blast higher the forward scatter so i told you about the universal plot or housekeeping plots so time plots which will ensure you a stable acquisition okay second forward scatter and side scatter plot helps you to see where, where all the populations are there and it can help you to eliminate the debris which can give you a nuisance in the subsequent plots so eliminate the debris in the forward scatter side scatter plot third select the singlet so that the doublets are excluded okay so how do you do singlet gate forward scatter area versus forward scatter height okay side scatter versus cd45 this is a very very important plot very important plot okay so this will tell you a lot of information on first look if you ask me i'll show you only one plot and you need to tell me what this case is show me the forward side scatter for cd45 that will help me to in diagnostic manner this is very helpful okay and let me introduce you something called mnc gate okay what is an mnc gate is selecting only the mononuclear cell region okay population okay and how do you do that with side scatter cd38 this is uh, well this was first introduced by i suppose dr prashant tambare who is who is, uh, who is very good in um, this particular flow cytometry clinical flow cytometry okay so this is side scatter versus cd38 you find this granulocytes which we are not interested in in leukemias and lymphomas okay like uh, most likely okay high side scatter so we'll be selecting a region uh, we'll be selecting population in this region which is called and this particular region is called mononuclear region okay so we can eliminate the granulocyte sites or the neutrophil straight away so that is called mnc gate okay now before you do analysis or flow cytometry these things are very important we have a very common dictum in pathology right your eyes cannot see what your brain doesn't know 
this applies for flow too. It's it is applicable for histopathology or anywhere. It is applicable for flow morphology anywhere. So your eyes cannot see what your brain does not know. You should know what are the normal hematopoietic population and what are the markers they express. Okay, CD one one seven is bright expressed in mast cells. If you don't know CD one one seven is express bright in mast cells, you can take that as a residual disease. You can get that bright 117 saying like, this is bright 117 and this is a myeloid blast which is expressing bright 117. So this is disease. So you can go wrong. So you should know what are the normal hematopoietic population and what are the markers it expresses. You should know what is normal progenitors. And this is very, very applicable to BALL immunophenotyping or BMRD detection. Okay, because Normal B cell development happens in the marrow and there is something called hematogons which are sitting in your marrow. They mimic like blast by morphology also and even in flow they can mimic like blast. You should know how to discriminate them from disease or leukemic cells and hematogons. You should be able to differentiate these two. That is the art of detecting MRD in BALL. Okay, I'll be discussing more on that in our MRD session. But you should know what are the normal progenitors. Okay, and... Uh, how to discriminate them from leukemic cells. You should know maturation patterns. This maturation patterns is how normal maturation happens. And you all, all know, uh, like leukemic cells, especially in acute leukemia, there will be a maturation arrest. You don't find the beautiful maturation pattern from immature to maturation happening to mature cells will not be there in leukemias. So this is very important. And you should know what are the mimics of blast and flow. Hematogons is a mimic of blast in morphology as well as in flow, it's a mimicker. And there are also some other population which will mimic like blast. And you should know what are the mimics blast so that you don't give a false positive uh, diagnosis. And you should also know normal population falling in the blast region. Okay. So what is this blast region? Is the next one. Let's see what is blast region. But before that, CD45. As I said, you give the first impression. If you ask me, I'll show you only one plot. And you need to tell me what is the likely diagnosis I'll, in, in a diagnostic marrow. Say, uh, in a diagnostic marrow, I would ask for side, side scatter CD45. Okay. So, acute leukemias are most often first recognized on side scatter versus CD45 plot. So, as, you, as we discussed, blast usually show low side scatter because blast does not express a lot of granules or does not express, I mean, most of the blast does not express uh, show vacuolations also. So, they express a low side scatter. And it exhibits a dim to intermediate CD45 expression. And this fall in the so-called blast region. I'll show you the image in the next slide. Okay. So normally blast will have low side scatter and CD45 is a marker which is gained by the cells as they mature. I repeat, CD45 is a marker which is gained or expression increases as the cells mature. So if you take the most precursor cell, it will have a very, very dim CD45. And if you take the most mature cells, like B, T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes or whatever, whatever, they will show you a bright CD45. One exception to this rule is plasma cells. Okay, leave plasma cells. Okay, because plasma cells, if you someone can put a point cycle, plasma cells is the most mature cells, but why is not showing bright CD45? So plasma cells is not applicable. But for all other things, this dictum fits in. Most immature, low CD45. High, well mature cells, brighter CD45 or high CD45. Okay, so blast of precursor cells or immature cells, so they have a very dim CD45. And low side scatter dim CD45 region is called the blast region. Okay, now let me uh, ask you some question. What is the difference between a region and a gate? Anyone? Anyone who wants to answer? You can unmute yourself and answer. What is the difference between a region and a blast? Normally, we know, we we answer uh, or when we discuss, no, we make a lot of new findings, great terminologies and so on. So, But when a simple question is asked, we fail to answer. What is the difference between a region and a gate? Sir, can I take a guess? Yeah, why not? See, it's all about guessing. Come on, it be as uh, uh, informal as possible. Come on. The gate uh, as uh, it is the boundary beyond which we will look for the abnormal cells or the blasts mm -hmm. and the region i suppose is a region is a localized area which is specific to most of the blast which will be falling in that region only uh, no 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 uh, Bisha, is this Bisha? sir sir no uh, don't restrict yourself to blast 
it's 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 related to flow cytometry um yo okay but let me tell you like i region that means uh, the, it is region means uh, where we are expecting that uh, cells to fall uh, that is uh, what i mean by region okay but my, uh, right i'll take that but still i'll tell you what is the region uh, i'll show you anyone else wants to take up a guess gating is i think selection of a subpopulation very good uh, and region is like uh, it can be any region whatever like fortify when we gate Mm. The all the uh, like monocyte region, lymphocyte region. Mm. These are all the region we can get right. them. So I'll tell you what. This is a mistake what most people do. We use this terms region and gate in a different way, wrong way. Most way we need to use the word region. We use the uh, you name. We use the name gate. For example, we say the name blast gate. See what is region is. Region is an area which you select by drawing boundaries. normally we use this term called gating right gating so region is what region is something a, a, a population or a, a cells what we are selecting by drawing boundaries is called region making a region when you apply that region in the another plot that is called gating okay so i'll tell you that when i get up uh, image i can show you that okay so as i said you this is the blast region so cd45 dim low side scatter okay the lymphoid blast can show cd45 dim variable negative or moderate okay so this all i'll tell you what is dim variable negative uh, you know that but still i can tell you sometime later uh, so cd45 can be dim variable negative especially negative cd45 comes in pal okay and moderate also moderate is close to the lymphocytes okay and tall blast typically has moderate cd45 in most of the occasions okay when compared to b lymphoid blast the leukemic cells of certain acute leukemias ah the example what i said you the leukemic cells of certain acute leukemias may be seen outside this blast region example apml acute promyelocyte leukemia where it may be not falling in the blast region at all typically showing intermediate to high side scatter okay now so this is cd45 so as i said you mature cells show higher cd45 and immature cells show weak cd45 you see this is maturation of b cells this is maturation of t cells this is maturation of myeloid cells and this is maturation of monocytes you see cd45 in the early stage what is lo acute leukemia acute leukemia most commonly arises from precursor cells so it arises from these cells in bll it arises from these cells in uh, um tall it arises in these cells especially if it's aml it arises here apml it arises here and cd45 again monocytic leukemia or monoplastic leukemia monoplastic leukemia arises here monocytic leukemia arises here you see the cd45 in precursors it is weak as the cells mature it is getting stronger except plasma cells so this is a heat map again cd45 is dim as as the cells mature it is getting brighter and brighter similarly for myeloid and similarly for monocytic leukemia so cd45 dim is an evidence that it's an immature cell okay all right now this is what we are discussing uh, so see selecting this particular this is like we draw a region like this okay with software we 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 draw a region like this this is called drawing or region selection okay this is called a region blast region when i applying this particular population in a another plot or in a another markers it's called gating so i'll show that tomorrow please remind me when we do live analysis i can show it in the software okay now coming to the blast gate so so you know this is side scatter cd45 you have cd45 negative rbcs and erythroid population here you find the myeloid cells exhibiting moderate cd45 which are high side scatter okay similarly you find the monocytes population sitting here the lymphocytes sitting here this population between the lymphocytes up to the rbcs that is cd45 dim this is cd45 negative this is cd45 dim cd45 moderate bright right population lying in this dim and moderate region with low side scatter is called a blast region is called a blast region now let me zoom this alone eliminate the myeloid cells so this appears like this okay so what are the populations which can fall in this cd45 positive dim gate cd4 or the blast region okay so you can find typically the myeloid blast sitting here i'm talking about normal 
normal okay so when you do a uh, when you process a bone marrow sample and see the sites at cd45 you find the myeloid blast sitting here the normal myeloid blast you find the basophil sitting in between the myeloid blast and the mature lymphocytes you find the hematogons with very low site scatter okay sitting in the cd45 dim to moderate area okay and similarly some early rbcs can be seen some plasma cells can be seen so these many populations can be seen in the blast gate though it is named blast gate there are some normal populations sitting in the blast gate of course in acute leukemia also you find the blast leukemic blast sitting in this gate okay so you should know what are the normal populations that are located in the blast gate okay so this will be a definite question what are the normal populations which are which will be present in the blast gate in acute leukemia what happens there will be expansion of neoplastic cells and these cells will be diminished correct so the blast will be occupying the entire area whereas in mrd you find the blast is I mean killed by the chemotherapy it comes very low and now you have a regenerating marrow where the normal cells will also start coming up at that time along with the disease blast or the leukemic blast you will find these normal elements also sitting with it at that time you need to discriminate them that is the art of detecting mrd in myeloid leukemias okay so normal population take home message normal population sitting in the myeloid myeloid i mean excuse me normal population sitting in the blast gate okay now this is again a normal population normal normal sample this is site scatter cd45 this is the lymphocytes exhibiting bright cd45 this is a monocytic population which lies above the uh, lymphocytes this is the granulocyte population and there is a population this is the myeloid blast normal myeloid blast population which is cd45 dim and between the myeloid blast population and lymphocyte population you find a population which is called which is the basophil population so in cases of cml you find this population to be more evident okay this is base of it plasma cells also fall here plasma cells also fall here something called pdcs okay plasma cytic dendritic cells they also fall here so these are the normal populations which can fall in the so called blast region okay now here the blast region is completely empty because it's more likely a peripheral blood which have caused it here okay so you find beautiful granulocytes beautiful monocytes lymphocytes and this is most likely red cells or erythroid here the blast gate is empty because it's a very if you do marrow this again this population this area some populations will be occupied okay when you find a very big population lying here lying from this particular place to this particular place always take cd45 negative also into consideration okay when you find a big population or a cluster falling in this particular area from the cd45 moderate area till the cd45 negative area that is a population which you need to look in acute leukemias that is a population you need to analyze in acute leukemias okay yes red cell erythroid fall in the cd45 negative area but still make sure it is red cells and erythroid because some blast of bll can fall in the cd45 negative area okay bll a subset of cases will be cd45 negative blast will be cd45 negative so don't think this is erythroid so no no blast no there could be blast you analyze this particular population and make sure it's red cells how do you make sure you can't run erythroid markers for this okay you need to see the other markers see whether it is cd38 positive or negative see whether it is positive for hla dr i'll discuss these two markers in the subsequent slides okay these it will be negative for this population will be negative for all the other lineage markers 19 will be negative myeloid markers will be negative it will be negative for t cell markers okay so make sure it is red cells okay so make sure that cd45 negative population is erythroid before saying blast is not seen or eliminating this population okay and in fact very important point is it question every population cluster use this is lymphocyte make sure it's lymphocyte make sure it's monocyte make sure it's neutrophils make sure this is erythroid question every population you are seeing because if you see the morphology you, you have found some blast and flow plot looking like this there's something wrong the blast could hide somewhere you need to explore and find it out so question every population in the plot okay that apml is the best example without seeing morphology the plot was looking very similar to this so these were all abnormal pro myelocytes with very high site scatter so we thought it as granulocytes the the june the, the jc thought it as granulocytes saying like nothing is there a morphology i have seen there is ap there is abnormal pro myelocytes went back gated this then 
we found these are all promyelocytes, abnormal promyelocytes. Similarly, don't exclude this population, this could be erythroids. Prove that is erythroids and then you exclude them. Okay, so that is very, very important. Otherwise, you'll go wrong. Now, see, this is something, a plot, forward scatter, side scatter plot, which is one among our universal plots. And you know what? See, this is a population which is disturbing us. Again, this could be RPCs, erythroids, whatever. And you find a population with very low side scatter and forward scatter. So when you find this population, the second step is you have to eliminate this population. So this is called live gate. So draw a live gate eliminating this particular population which is low forward scatter height, uh, low forward scatter and low side scatter. Okay, so you have the lymphocytes here. So the blast or any interesting population cannot have a smaller size than lymphocytes. Correct? Lymphocytes are the smallest cells. If provided you are doing analysis of leukocytes. If you are doing analysis of platelets and arbits, it's a different story. Okay. Now, since we are discussing leukemia and lymphoma, we don't have any cells of interest which is smaller than lymphocytes. So, you can eliminate these populations. This is likely RBCs, platelet debris or something which can in interfere with your analysis. They cause this non-specific staining and they become a junk in most of our uh, plots. So, eliminate them. So, first, second step after seeing the type plot, eliminate these populations. Now, you see the CD45 area is much clearer. But still, there are some events here, but still, it's much clearer uh, than the, this one. So, always go by a sequential gating style. Don't directly go, get ah, CD45 negative population, come on, blast, no. So, blast can be CD45 negative, especially in PALL. Okay, similarly in AML, erythroid leukemias, which is very, very rare, M6, can be CD45 negative. Okay, so blast can be, so don't always restrict yourself to the so-called blast region, which starts from here, ends here. Because blast region is typically defined as CD45 moderate to dim area. So it stops here. But always extend your gate to the negative area because P lymphoid blast, a subset of P lympho blast can be CD45 negative. And if you're excluding them, thinking it is erythroid or a thing, you will go wrong. Okay, so this this is how you draw you need to draw the gate. So this is lymphocytes, monocytes. What is this population? What is this population? Anyone? Basophil. Basophil. Yeah, so basophil. Blast myeloid blast. If it's there, it, normal myeloid blast will be falling here, or abnormal myeloid blast will be falling here. No, so so you need to see the complete this population. Okay, and. If it is APML, this is the area where you need to see, not this areas. Okay, so very, be very careful. And uh, as you all know, since we are dealing with acute leukemia in this session, I'm more interested in this. So the second part of this <laughs> uh, course, I'll be concentrating only on this area, more likely. CD45 pride, where CLPD stops, along with the lymphocytes. Okay. Now, this is a very beautiful schematic diagram showing how where the common, uh, uh, where the blast lie in common leukemias, okay? Now, this is typically where the blast lies in AML, non-APML AML. I'm putting that point, non-APML AML. This is where most of the blasts in AMLs will lie. That is myeloid blast, abnormal myeloid blast or in AML leukemic cells will lie. Whereas in DALL or ALL, the blast will lie in this fashion. You see, in ALL, the intensity of CD45 in blast is lower compared to blast, myeloid blast. So, I'm to not talking about normal here. I'm talking about abnormal, okay? So, in AML blast, the CD45 will be moderate or dim expression. It will be dim expression. Okay? Whereas, CD45, it will be dim to negative. Okay? It will be dim to negative. Similarly, when you compare BALL blast and TALL blast, the, this is TALL blast. The TALL blast will relatively show higher CD45 compared to BALL. But still, it will not be as, TALL blast will not be as brighter than as lymphocytes. The green is the lymphocyte population here. That is the blast. It, you can see the most of the TALL blast will be falling in the negative and up to the, and goes up to uh, uh, moderate uh, intensity and it's, it's slightly abutting the lymphocytes. It slightly touches the lymphocyte. Whereas in B lymphoid blast, you find the blast will occupy the dim or the negative region. Okay, so I repeat AML blast, CD45 dim. Okay, CD45 dim region. Or sometimes if it's monocytic leukemia, it can fall here. 
the more the moderate area okay apml it falls here okay so, lymphoid pal blast the blast will be more likely dim to negative okay you find the pattern like this and tall you find the blast in the dim and it goes and abuts the normal lymphocytes also Okay, but Anya, we are not going to diagnose BLL, DLL uh, with only CD45, right? This is pattern how the blast falls in the CD45 plot, which is very important. Okay, so again, CD45 in B lymphoid blast, you see it's from dim to negative area. Okay, now these are some examples of uh, how the blast in acute leukemia slides. So this is, you see, this is lymphocytes. You find some diminished granulocytes only because in acute leukemia, the marrow will be completely replaced by the neoplastic cells. Some lymphocytes may be there. There may not be much monocytes or myeloid cells. So this is the blast. See the blast? It's lying from CD45 negative to CD45 dim area. Okay. And you see, this is a typical blast region. Here, the blast typically lies in the defined blast region. Okay. And you find here, the blast lying from dim to negative region. Again, here also dim to negative region. Dim to negative region. It goes like that. Okay. And when it goes to negative, BLL blast are very commonly show this pattern. Negative. Dim to negative. Negative blast. Okay. So green is the monocyte. Here red is the lymphocyte. Here this is the blast. This is the blast. This is the lymphocyte. This is uh, neutrophils. This is lymphocytes. This is blast. Okay. And this is blast, this is lymphocytes. So, any doubts? Any doubts? Clear? Crystal clear? Great. And for beginners, I'll tell a point. Some people may not be following it so great because uh, this is more advanced, right? So, I my uh, thing to you is that if, if you if you are a starter uh, who wants to do flow and you don't have the equipment, I, I did that for two years. I didn't have a machine for two years. I, I had only desire to do it flow, but I, uh, I used to stare at the reports. Whenever you get a chance, flow report, have a look at them. Be a critic for that report. See how they have defined the blast. See what are the markers they have used. How they have interpreted the markers. Have a very thorough look or multiple times you look at the reports. That will help you to memorize the markers. Okay, so some advantage you get and slowly you see the plots you learn. Okay, so yeah, there is one question clear. Perfect. Thanks, doctor. Um, so now let's go for the panels. So as I said to you, PALL will not have a separate panel. PALL will not have a separate panel or AML will not have a separate panel. They have a common markers which will be run for any leukemia, leukemia cases. And that is called acute leukemia panel. Some people call that as acute leukemia orientation tube or something like that. But I, uh, uh, I use three tubes where I have B tube for, uh, for first is my B tube, second is a myeloid tube, third is a T tube. For any leukemia, which I, when I find a blast, I'll ask my tick to run these three tubes. I will never bother, though I find an R rod, I would never hesitate avoiding a B or a T tube. I would ask him to run all the three tubes together. Okay, that is very important. Always have a comprehensive panel. Okay, so what all markers that the panel should include? The panel should include lineage markers. Okay, for example, B, you know what are the lineage markers? 19, 20, 22, okay, 10, and so and so. Okay, myeloid, you have 13, 33, 117, 15, so and so. T cell, you have CD3, CD5, CD7, CD4, CD8, CD2, so and so. So it should include all the common lineage markers of the B cells, T cells and the myeloid cells. Then you should definitely have a lineage specific marker. Okay. What is the difference between lineage markers and lineage specific markers? Lineage markers are lineage associated markers. It can be, it, it, it is commonly expressed in that particular lineage. But lineage specific markers shows the commitment of that cells to the lineage. For example, cytocd 3 is a lineage specific marker for T cells. You cannot find a B cell, B lymphoid blast apparently expressing cytocd 3 That's not possible. If cytocd 3 is present, that, that particular cells or the blast have been committed for T. Similarly, if the blast is expressing cyto MPO, that means the blast has been committed towards myeloid lineage. 
if the blast is co-expressing cytoMPO and cytoCD3, you need to put them as Nexon phenotype acute leukemia. You can't say it's an AML expressing cytoCD3. Apparently expressing cytoCD3. No, that's not possible. So that is, in case, if it's an AML which is expressing CD56 or CD7, now I cannot call it as MPAR or Mixed Phenotype Acute Leukemia because 7 is not a lineage-specific marker. I would, Now I would call it as AML with aberrant CD7. So you are understanding the difference? So lineage markers are different, lineage-associated markers are different, lineage-specific markers are different. What are the lineage-specific markers? Cytoplasmic MPO for AML or myeloid cells. Cytocd3 for T cells. CD19 in a bright fashion for B cells. If it is dim, there is other markers to help out. Okay. If it is monocytic, we have uh, four markers like CD14, CD64, CD36, 11B or 11C. Okay. So there are lineage specific markers. Okay. Then it should include, since we are dealing with acute leukemias, it should include immaturity markers. Then only you will be sure that the blast are in, uh, the abnormal cells are immature. So it should include immaturity markers. Markers that differentiate normal from abnormal cells. For example, in, if in a bone marrow, I said you hematogons may be present, which may be mimicking like blast. So you need some markers to differentiate hematogons and blasts. Okay, so those markers have to be there in the panel. Then you need MRD markers. So it's not like you do flow, give the diagnosis, wash your hands, upper finish game. No, it's not like that. You are also giving some signature of that particular blast, which is called as leukemia associated immunophenotype. So you are, you, are, you are taking some important information or the phenotype of the blast. You save that. And when the patient is, again, the marrow is done after induction chemotherapy, you will use the signature to track the residual disease. So you need to have some MRD markers or minimal residual disease markers, which helps you to pick up due after the treatment or the induction the chemotherapy or at, at multiple time points of uh, treatment. Okay. Then you can have additional uh, assays like doing a ploidy okay in BLL you can do that in myeloma you can do that it, 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 it adds a point towards the prognosis okay you can if it's a shipped sample some people working in standalone laboratories may get samples from different parts of the states or somewhere so you need to have a viability attack in the particular tube to assess how much viable cells are there then if you want to you are working in a very high flow uh, particular center then you can have beautiful other markers to predict cytogenetic abnormalities. For example, pH like ALL, you can have a marker like CRLF2 to predict pH like ALL, which has a very poor prognosis. Okay, so this is all, it is good if you do this, but these are all basics, it should be there. You can't do immunophenotyping without these markers. I get some cases for analysis from outside. When I ask like, why didn't you do this marker? He said like, no, no, sir, that antibody got over. Then you don't do it. You, if you are doing it a compromise and you are reporting it, there is a chance you can make an error. And when you are not giving a correct diagnosis, you may be right in 9 of 10 occasions. If one thing you go wrong and when the patient elapses, it's going to be a very bad news for the patient. So when you are treating, you have to treat at the beginning perfectly. Once the disease relapses, it's going to be very bad. Okay. So these are all things which, is, which should be embedded in a good acute leukemia panel. Now, what are the lineage associated markers? I told you, right? B cell markers 19, 79, 8, 20, 22, 24. 24 we use uh, when 19 is not there, but still 24 you can have. Uh, but it, it should be there when uh, some, it, it can be included, but not very mandatory. But when patient is for cell therapy or something, then it comes into play. Uh, but now you just don't give much importance to this. 19, 79, 8, 20, 22, if needed, 24, which is also a B cell marker. It's not very specific to B cell because even granulocytes can be, that's why it's called lineage associated markers. Okay. Myeloid markers, CD117, 33, 13, 15, 64. Of course, it's a monocytic marker, CD11B. It can be expressed in my, uh, myeloid cells also. It's not a monocytic, only monocytic marker. It can be expressed in myeloid cells also, CD11B. T cell marker, CD3, 7, 5, 2, 56, 4, and 8. So these are called lineage associated markers. Remember, they are not, I mean, except 19 years. And CD3, okay, these are on lineage specific markers. These are lineage associated markers. Remember, other lineage associated markers can be apparently expressed in blast. For example, in the case of BALL, okay, uh, CD13 and 33 can be apparently expressed. Okay, it's very common in Philadelphia positive BALL. 
especially in adults. In adults, a B lymphoid blast can express CD33 and 30. So that may occur in pH positive BAL. Similarly, an AML can apparently express CD90, which is commonly seen in AML with translocation 821. Similarly, AML can apparently express CD7. It can apparently express CD56. So, other lineage markers, lineage associated markers can be apparently expressed in blast. And of course, this, this, this is apparently expressed, right? So, during MRD tracking, it helps you to differentiate normal myeloid blast and leukemic myeloid blast. Similarly, it can help you to differentiate between hematogons and B, uh, B lymphoblast, B leukemic lymphoblast, abnormal B leukemic lymphoblast. Okay. So, that is about lineage associated markers. Now, coming to lineage specific marker. So, these are the markers which will give you the diagnosis. So, for my, a myeloid to, for calling a leukemia myeloid, we want myeloperoxidase positivity. To call it monocytic, as I said you, it should have at least two of the following. Okay, CD1464, 11C. Okay, for T lineage, the blast should be either cytoplasmic CD3 positive or it should be surface CD3 positive. Okay, then B lineage, I told you strong CD19. And at least one of the following, that is CD10, CD17 in here or cytoplasmic CD2. Then blast express weak CD19, that is it is not to the intensity of normal B cells. When I say strong CD19, it means the blast express CD19 up to the level of normal B cells. Okay, when it is weak, it means like the blast is expressing CD19, but not to the intensity of normal B cells. It is likely dimmer than that. Then you need to have strong expression of other markers like CD17NA, cytoplasmic CD22 or CD10. So this is there in the WHO uh, book. Basically, they have described this for criteria for establishing MPAR. But still, when you want to assign a lineage in tough cases, this will be very helpful. Okay. Now, that's what the difference I said to you. These are lineage-specific markers, especially myeloperoxidase, cytoplasmic CD3 or CD3, CD19. So, these are all very lineage, strong CD19, I tell you, because CD19 can be apparently expressed in AML also. So, CD19 along with it. These two markers is very specific. MPO for myeloid, cytoplasmic CD3 for T. B cells. Okay. So lineage, uh, that's the difference between lineage associated and lineage specific markers. Okay. So some acute leukemia, lineage assignment may be very ambiguous, I mean, very challenging, especially in mixed phenotype acute leukemias. Okay. I'll show you some cases uh, during our analysis. So then coming to markers of immaturity. So any doubts now? Any doubts you can ask me? Any lineage specific and lineage associated markers? Any doubts? Can I go for immaturity markers? Um, sir, in MPA, this MPO and uh, the lineage specific markers, MPO and cytoplasmic CD3 should be bright? Uh, not exactly. It cannot be, uh, see, MPO and uh, uh, there's nothing like, it can't be bright. Uh, it, it should reach up to the number of, level of normal internal controls. I'll tell you what, In uh, if, if there is a blast which you are suspecting mixed phenotype acute leukemia, T bar myeloid. Okay. Now, this particular blast should show MPO positivity convincingly. That is, a part of the blast should be up to the level of neutrophils in MPO. And similarly, the blast should show cytocd 3 positivity up, touching to the level of normal T cells. Okay. Then you can confidently call this particular case as mixed phenotype acute leukemia T bar myeloid. Okay. See, when I'm discussing TALL, I can show you cases for that. Okay. It's not mandatorily uh, like uh, so some slight popping up, slight uh, things may not be uh, giving you a so confident uh, thing about. So, for MPO, see, some most of the labs are have a problem in standardizing MPO and TDT. So, what you can do, you can do cytochemistry. If cytochemistry is positive in the blast, Okay, then you can take that. But if you, the answer to your question is, you check the internal controls always. That's why when someone sends me plot or something to analyze, I would ask them to send me the plot with the internal controls. Then only I know whether the antibody is dropped, whether the internal control intensity is good, and how the blast is expressing MPO compared to the neutrophils, how the blast is expressing cytocd 3 when compared to T cells. So then only I can, I'm not expecting the blast to fall overlap with normal T cells in cytocd 3 or normal neutrophils in cytoplasmic MPO. At least they should touch the normal cells. 
so that uh, I can take them as positive. Okay, so that's a very important point when it comes to TALL, especially in uh, diagnosing ATP ALL, which can be cytosine 3 very deep. I'll discuss that next uh, next class, next Wednesday. Is that, uh, you, I mean, you got an idea, Dr. Shiny? Fine. Any other doubts? Right. So, no other doubts. Uh, I'll just proceed. Okay. Now, coming to the immaturity associated markers. Now, as I said, you like CD45, there are markers which the B cells, normal B cells, acquire as they mature. So, this is early hematogons or precursor B cells. Then they become um, like stage 2 hematogons. Then they become mature or uh, transitional B cells. Then they become mature B cells and then they leave the bone marrow, go to the secondary lymphoid organ and further things happen. We are not bothered about this. This happens in CLPD, so we will eliminate that. Now, coming to this particular area, see, when the B cells are immature and, you know, BLL is something, uh, leukemia arising from the precursor B cells, right? So, the precursor cells typically show, as I discussed, a weak CD45. It expresses TDT, especially in early precursors. The late precursors will will be TDT negative. So when the blast is expressing TDT, it most likely be a color positive BLL. When the blast is not expressing TDT, it could be pre-BLL. Similarly, CD34, it's expressed in early hematogons, stage 1 hematogons. In stage 2 hematogons, CD34 is lost. Okay? So this particular area, that is again, so mostly pre-BLL will be CD34 negative. CD10 will be positive in most of the immature cells. As the cells mature, they lose. Okay, normal circulating mature B cells, CD10 will be negative. When they go and become a follicular center, then CD10 becomes again gets expressed. So that we are not dealing it now. So CD10 is positive in immature cell, immature B cells. Okay, or leukemic uh, in, in BLL also. Okay, and then CD20. CD20 is negative in early hematogons. Then it slowly acquires. Then the intensity increases. Okay, so similarly in BLL, CD20 will be negative or it can be most in most cases it will be deep. very rarely it becomes moderate it, it is expressed in a moderate fish that is up to the level of normal b cells okay similarly in BALL or the immature b cells igd igm kappa lambda these all will be negative because these are all expressed only when the cell is mature after the transitional stage or in the mature b cells okay so these are some of the markers of immaturity in b cells Okay, so our panel should encompass this marker so that we can confirm the immaturity. And acute leukemia is all about blast. I mean, acute leukemia is all about fighting immature markers in the blast, right? Or the immature markers in the neoplastic cells. Okay, there's a beautiful diagram. So this will show you the expression of markers in normal cells. And of course, you can see the immature markers which can help you to diagnose BLL. Now you see this is a typical... PALL, where you find the red population is blast and the blue population is lymphocyte. You see, the blast is CD45. Starting from the moderate area, moderate expression, it goes up to the negative area. In CD45 is in the y-axis, okay? So, the blast is from the moderate, it goes up to the negative area. You have an internal control lymphocytes. Okay? You find the blast here, which is expressing CD34, which is an immature marker, stem cell marker. So, the blast is positive for CD34. So, one immature marker is there, CD45, uh, weak expression is one immaturity uh, sign. CD34 expression is another immaturity sign. CD10 expression is another immaturity sign. You find CD20, most of the blasts are negative. A small subset is dim positive. Okay, you have a normal internal control here, normal B cells. You see the intensity, the blast is negative for CD20. Or it is showing only a small subset which is dim positive. It's not even reaching up to the level of normal uh, B cells here. Okay, and it is negative for both kappa and lambda. Now I'm sure that it's an immature B cell, neoplastic B cell. Okay. Now this is what I said to you. So markers of immaturity, down-regulated CD45, CD34, TDT. Okay, and the other supporting things is CD10 because why I have said supporting is CD10 positivity can be seen in Burkitt's lymphoma. Okay, so just interpreting only CD10, you cannot call it as immature. Okay, so but CD10 along with these markers, it's very helpful. CD10 is again an immaturity associated marker. Down regulation of CD20 is an immature associated marker. 
normally in our panel we don't include kappa lambda but still absence of kappa lambda is again a sign of immaturity okay and as i said you very very important don't interpret anything with one single marker of course cd34 is fine but other things you don't interpret with one marker always see it with multiple markers and confirm the immaturity of the neoplastic cells okay good now now going back to this i said you these are all immature cells now you are you are confident that these are all immature cells but how do you know these are all abnormal immature cells and not normal progenitors which are hematopods correct so i so we had markers to detect immaturity in the cells but how to make sure that they are all not normal progenitors which are hematogons and make sure that these are all disease cells or leukemic cells so for that you need to have some markers which will help you to differentiate between normal precursors and abnormal precursors okay and how do you differ i mean uh, differentiate this is by the expression patterns okay normal hematogons or normal progenitor populations express antigens in a consistent way because they follow a typical pattern i'll show you in the next slide they, they show a consistent pattern and they show a reproducible maturation pattern so you run you if you run so many normal marrows you isolate the hematogons they all show the typical expression and they show a typical maturation pattern in all the cases whereas neoplastic cells they behave in their own way right so they show increased or decreased normal antigens for example cd10 in hematogons it will be the, the intensity will be only moderate but in neoplastic bll it can be bright the intensity is very high similarly hematogons always will be cd38 moderate positive it will be cd38 positive whereas bll cells uh, cd38 can be negative and that is a sign of abnormality it can't be normal precursors so decrease normal antigens and similarly cd19 can be bright in neoplastic cells okay cd34 can be bright in neoplastic cells whereas in normal it should be positive but in a typically normal fashion that is the so called uh, uh, pattern which it needs to express whereas neoplastic will show increased or decreased normal antigens it can show asynchronous maturation expression so for example i'll show what is asynchronous because any of in uh, mrd i'll be taking this but making very fast see you can't have a marker one immature and one mature so if it is normal cells it should follow this pattern for example if it is cd34 positive it should be cd20 negative if it is normal hematogens if you find a population which is cd34 positive and also cd20 moderate positive then it is abnormal this is called asynchronous maturation you can't find this, because normal maturation happens in a set pattern okay cd34 should be positive then it loses cd34 and then it acquires cd20 as the cell matures from stage 1 hematogons to stage 2 hematogons but as if you find a neoplastic population which is expressing cd34 and 20 it's definitely abnormal okay so that is one more point so asynchronous maturation patterns then aberrant antigen expression normal myeloid blast or normal uh, so for example since we are discussing b little normal b lymphoid blast will or hematogons sorry uh, normal hematogons will not express aberrant myeloid markers normal hematogons will not express aberrant myeloid markers if you find uh, abnormal i mean uh, b cell progenitors which are expressing myeloid markers like 66c 13 or 33 then it can't be hematogons it is definitely abnormal precursors or disease blast okay so that is called aberrant antigen expression then homogeneous expression normally in hematogons you find a maturation pattern happening that is cells starts moving from one stage to other whereas in all there is a maturation error so you find a bulk of disease without that maturation pattern okay i'll show you the images now see beautiful hematogons here this is called the maturation patterns okay you see the colors here the this particular population this particular color the so called green blue or something that is stage 1 the yellow color is stage 2 then the purple is stage 3 you see 10 is positive at that stage it is 20 negative it becomes stage 2 where 20 is slowly acquired then when it is becoming mature b cells it is losing 10 similarly you find here cd45 is dim in stage 1 it acquires a bit of cd45 then cd20 is acquired then you see here the mature b cells will like show more cd45 compared to stage 2 compared to stage 1 Okay, similarly, if I see CD38, hematogons will be CD38 positive. 
But once it becomes mature pieces, CD38 is lost. And you see here, CD10 is positive, 38 is positive, and 38 is negative, 10 is also getting down-regulated. So you find this beautiful maturation patterns in hematogons. Whereas in blast, you can't find this. This one I just showed you in the last session, right? So this is again uh, hematogons. Red is stage 1, blue is stage 2, green is mature lymphocytes. You see the pattern, a beautiful pattern, the maturation pattern. You don't find, uh, th there's a pattern running through. So the cells are, these are all completely B cells. These are all fully B cells. You see the maturation pattern happening. If it is leukemia, you find, don't find this maturation. You find a bulk of population sitting there. I'll show you a case. So again, so these are all beautiful hematogon maturation patterns. So I'll be sh showing these again in MRT. Okay. You see TDT is there. It's stage 1 hematogons. Then it loses TDT. Then the red is the stage 1. Yellow is the stage 2. Green is the stage 3. Then it loses. So you see how the blast progressively as they mature, lose one marker or gain one marker. And that's what the maturation pattern is called. This is a classic waterfall pattern. 1020. Waterfall pattern. Similarly, you see CD38. Hematogon CD38 positive. As they mature, what happens? CD38 goes down and 20 is acquired. Whereas stage 1 does not show 20. And what I've labeled here as ABC is abnormal pattern. When you find a B lymphoid precursor sitting in this one of this ABC, it means it's definitely a disease because hematogons will not show this pattern. You can't find an hematogon which is TDT positive and CD10 negative. You can't find an hematogon on our normal cells which is CD34 negative and 45 negative or CD34 positive and CD45 negative. So this ABC is an abnormal areas. When you find B cell precursor sitting in this ABC areas, it is definitely disease. This is called leukemia associated immunophenotype. Okay, so your panel should also have markers to differentiate this. And such marker is one among such markers, CD38. Okay, I'll discuss that. So you see this, this is I'm comparing both leukemia, a BALL, and normal hematogons. You see the hematogons so beautifully maturing. Here you see there is no maturation at all. The blast is sitting like that. A complete population. So this is typical maturation arrest and this is no maturation pattern. And see the expression of 10? Bright. You see the expression of pattern here? You compare it here? Bright. Okay, that's that's definitely abnormal. Similarly, 34, you can't find hematogons. 38 negative. Here you find this precursor, it's expressing 10, it is 45 dim, it's a B cell precursor, but it is 38 negative. So definitely disease. Okay, see here 10 is positive. And it 38 negative, definitely disease. This is this a population like here is disease definitely. And whereas you compare this with hematogons, this is how the pattern should be for a normal hematogons. Okay, normal B cell precursors. Okay. So this is all very highly informative. For MRD also, now this will help me. This 38 negativity will help me to track the residual leukemic cells in MRD. Okay. This is called leukemia associated immunophenotype. This this pattern, this absorbing A, B, C, you know, this will be our leukemia associated immunophenotype. That is the patterns which helps us to differentiate abnormal blast from normal hematogons. Okay? Right. So, basically, leukemic cells don't follow rules. Whereas hematogons, they follow the set of rules. And that's how we differentiate hematogons from abnormal B-cell precursors or leukemic blast. Okay? Then your, mark, your panel should also have MRD tracking markers. Okay? Apart from uh, using your regular markers 19, 10, 34, you should also have some markers very specific for MRD, like CD58, in which the BALL, B lymphoid blast will show overexpression of CD58 in some cases, whereas hematogons will not show. Overexpression of CD73 is an MRD, MI, is, a, is a characteristic leukemia associated immunophenotype which hematogons will not show. Okay? CD86, CD304, CD81. So, Underexpression of CD81 is a leukemia associated immunophenotype because hematogons will not show CD underexpression of CD81. They show normal CD81, moderate CD81 expression. Similarly, overexpression of CD23. Hematogons will not show overexpression of CD123. Whereas, if it's leukemic uh, B cell precursors, abnormal B cell precursors, they show overexpression of CD123. So, these are all, and similarly, underexpression of the other markers which is there in the panel CD38, CD45, CD20, or overexpression of 19, 10, 34. These are all some markers or uh, which will help you to tell these are all abnormal. These can't be normal B cell precursors. So these markers will help you to differentiate normal hematogons from abnormal B cell precursors or blast. Okay. Any doubts?
see this may be appearing a bit difficult to you don't worry we'll just go on uh, analysis so you can understand okay basically you need to dif differentiate leukemic cells from hematogons and that is the reason why i'm discussing all those things in diagnostic it may not be so so important but in mrd this is very important yeah any doubts excuse me sir yeah please hello yeah any doubts sir uh, so basically uh, yeah, in been... mrd so we have to have your voice is feeble, Doctor. I couldn't get you. Could you make yourself more clear? Yeah? You're there? Okay, fine. Uh, if you have a question, please put the chat box. Others, it's clear? Okay, now. So, apart from those markers, what we discussed, the two other markers which will be come, uh, regularly coming in our panel, of course, in T, myeloid, even in B, is CD38. Okay, what is the CD38 is? CD38 is bright in plasma cells. It's positive in normal myeloid cells. It's positive in monocytes, basophils, hematogons, and NK cells. Of course, it's a gating marker for plasma cells. Okay, it, as I showed you in the earlier slide, it is also useful in selecting the mononuclear population by site scatter versus CD38. Okay, that's a typo here. It's also an, an indicator of immaturity in PAL. Okay. Indicator of immaturity in T lymphoid. Of course, the hematogons are also CD38 positive, but only with that we cannot say. But it, it, it's an indicator. It's an MRD tracking marker. I said you know hematogons will be CD38 moderate positive, whereas hematogons will be. I mean, hematogons will show moderate CD38. Some DLL can show down regulation of CD38, which becomes a leukemia associated immunophenotype or signature of leukemic cells. It also useful in identifying leukemic stem cells. Leukemic stem cells are stem cells, are stem cells which are CD34 positive and 38 negative. Okay, so it's also useful in identifying leukemic stem cells. Okay, now HLADR is another beautiful marker which is there in your panel. You should know it's positive in normal myeloid blast, monocytes, B cells, and it is an activation marker in T cells. Okay, it's an MHC class 2 molecule, only in antigen presenting cells. So HLADR will be positive in B cells, but not in T cells. Because B cells are antigen presenting cells, T cells are not antigen presenting T, uh, antigen presenting cells. Okay, only when T cells are activated, they show HLADR. Okay, it is always positive in BALL. Okay, most likely in except very rare cases of uh, CD10 negative BALL, most of the BALL cases will be HLADR positive. And beauty of why HLADR is important is in immunophenotypy, HLADR is negative in TALL. APML, erythroleukemia, that is M6, megakaryocytic leukemia, and a subset of AML, which are NPM1 mutated. Okay, in a subset of AML, which is NPM1 mutated, HLADR will be negative. I repeat, HLADR is always or most commonly positive in BALL. It is negative in TALL, APML, erythroleukemia, megakaryocytic leukemia, and a subset of AML called NPM1 mutated AM. Okay. It can be negative in monocytic leukemia also, but uh, HLADR is a very, very important marker. So, summing up, we should have markers, lineage markers, we should have lineage specific markers, we should have immaturity markers, we should have MRD markers. Okay, so summing up all these, and this is how your panel should be. So, a minimum panel for acute leukemia should include all these markers. All these markers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this 6 one. It should have a backbone marker, which is CD45, which helps you to know whether uh, the disease population is 45 negative or 45 dim region. You should have immaturity marker like CD34, TDT. It should have myeloid lineage markers, specific markers like cytoplasmic MPO and associated markers like CD117, 13, 33, 15, 11B. B lymphoid markers, CD10, 19, 22. Cyto 79A, CD20, T lymphoid markers like lineage specific marker like cytoplasmic CD3, lineage specific uh, uh, surface CD3, and other lineage associated markers like 1A, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8. 1A is also an immaturity marker for T, TL, only for TL. Other markers, as we discussed, HLADR and 30, that is beautiful markers that also will help you to discriminate or uh, identify the disease blast positive. 
with this tube if you want you see there is a monocytic differentiation then you need to add a monocytic tube with this markers if you find that the cd45 the blast is cd45 negative hlad are negative then and morphology you found plebs in the cells then you need to add a megakaryocytic marker and if you need it you need to add bpdcn uh, plasma cell and dendritic cell markers okay uh, so only with these markers you need to call up for the other tubes when they are needed otherwise most of the cases you can finish with these tubes these markers with these four tubes or five okay so acute leukemia as i say you don't have a panel for bal you don't have a panel for dal you don't have a panel for aml it's like acute leukemia common panel and any blast you find you need to put it through that panel so this is some examples of acute leukemia too. okay so so we we have around uh, we we'll say this case uh, this particular we have one two three four this is p tube this is mylar tube this is t tube this is cytoplasmic or lineage specific tube so all the cyto markers i used to add up in one tube because cyto staining needs an additional step of fixation and permeabilization i don't want all the tubes to undergo through that process because fixation and permeabilization permeabilization is an extra reagent or extra chemical which can affect the markers so i have grouped up all the cytoplasmic markers in one tube okay and this is p markers with the mrd markers this is myeloid markers this is t cell markers and this is lineage markers okay cyto mpo for b cell I mean for myeloid cell myeloid lineage cyto cd3 for t lineage cyto 17 any though it's not a lineage specific cyto cd since it's a cytoplasmic marker i've added in this particular tube okay and i have some gating markers for the blast 34 45 11b and 17 something like okay if anything from these markers if i infer it's a monocytic i add a monocytic tube if i feel an additional marker for pll uh, to understand the I mean to predict the cytogenetics or extra mrd tracking markers are needed i add this particular tube okay so tslpr is something which comes positive in a subset of ph like al okay don't confuse i don't want to go very deep into that because we are dealing with phenotyping now cd304 is again an mrd marker and in, if it's a all this particular tube will be run basically tdt comes positive in all and cyto igm to differentiate between kala positive pll and pre pll okay so this is the markers this is one example for one panel this is example of another panel where this is a 13 color panel where they do two tubes and based on the outcome of markers outcome of results of these two tubes they add a b specific tube and a t specific tube you may ask sir you said like it should be run as a panel why now b specific t specific remember these two panels uh, two tubes itself has encompassed most of the markers it has encompassed most of the markers okay some b cell markers which is not apparently seen in t or myeloid is put here similarly some t cell markers which is not commonly commonly apparently seen in t or myeloid is included here so if it is from these two tubes for example if it is cd19 positive okay and if it is uh, cd34 positive cd45 is negative and then if cd19 is positive so if they think it's bl then this particular tube will be used okay they will not put this tube similarly if it is cyto cd3 positive okay and some t markers are positive then this particular tube will be included so these two two tubes will be mandatorily done and based on the outcome of the results either a b specific tube or a t specific tube will be done if it is myeloid leukemia these two tubes itself will cover most of all the myeloid markers okay so that is one way or the other example for a panel now this is like acute leukemia orientation tube so this tube will tell you a tube a very simple tube which tells you what uh, leukemia we are dealing with which uh, i am not a big fan of this um, i don't use this because it's like two or three time job once you want to do you do all the markers just running this tube see the results then go back again staining the other tubes i do i i am not different but still i just want to show you this is euroflow acute leukemia orientation tube which includes 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 markers so you have cyto cd3 which is lineage specific for t cytoplasmic mpo lineage specific for myeloid okay you have cd45 which is the backbone marker you have cytoplasmic cd17 na for b cells and you have 19 for b cells so these two if it comes positive then it's more likely a baln when this comes positive it's more likely an aml if this comes positive it's more likely a tal similarly you have one more marker cd7 it supports the diagnosis of t 
or AML when it is aberrantly expressed. Okay. It can be expressed. AML can show aberrant CD cell. Okay. So the purpose of this, so you have some immaturity markers like CD45, CD34, and uh, so surface CD3 is mature. So you have 45 and 34 as immature markers, and you have lineage specific markers, so which helps you to give the diagnosis. Whether are you AM de dealing with the case of AML or a BLL or a TLL, this tube again will not help you to detect appearances because appearances you need to put some more markers. And similarly, this tube is not having any MRT markers. Okay, it's a simple tube which will tell you what type of acute leukemia is this. That's it. Now, how do you go about the analysis? So, some more slides, just two or three more slides. So, any doubts? Uh, chat box has many doubts. Yeah, so let me take one, Dr. Lakshmi. Uh, can any lineage associated B markers be apparently expressed in myeloid blast? Yes, of course, I told you now. CD19 can be apparently expressed in a sub, sub, in a set of AML cases which has translocation 821. Translocation run X1, run XG1. That can show apparently apparent CD19. Even by morphology, you can suspect it. Splinter like or rods, pseudo chidiakigashi, uh, perinuclear halo. Okay, so 821 can apparently show CD19. Okay, sir, if we are doubtful with morphology and need to put a screening to which all markers this acute leukemia orientation tube, this acute leukemia orientation tube you can use. Okay, Dr. Lakshmi. And uh, Dr. Menas, for doing immunophenotype for from TBF. I'm not getting this, doctor. Dr. Menas, you are there. How much blast percentage is needed? Peripheral blood, if it is. So, uh, assuming uh, peripheral blood, for doing immunophenotype from peripheral blood, how much blast percentage is needed? So, it depends upon your uh, total leukocyte count. Can ever, I mean, you can hear me, right? I suppose I. Uh... So she can unmute herself and talk to you. Fine, fine. Because suddenly I just got a pop up message saying like you have been muted. Fine. So coming back to the questions. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Menas, it's like uh, two things you need to look into consideration. One is the total count. If you have a good total count, 20,000 is a, uh, a total leukocyte count. And the blast percentage is just. 5%, still you can do it by flow. Or even if it is 20,000 count and if it is 5%, 3%, yes, you can attempt flow. And uh, the, on the contrary, if you have a total count of just 2,000 and the blast is 60%, still you can do. So basically, it's the absolute blast count that matters. And the when you can't do flow in peripheral blood is when the total count is just 500 cells and you're finding 4% blast. And that's very difficult. At that time, you need to suggest them to do a map. Sajna, uh, should we have all the markers you listed in an MRD panel? No, it depends upon what markers you want. Uh, in experience, I would say CD73 is a very good MRD marker. So better have it in your baseline, of, I mean, in your diagnostic phenotype. Of course, CD38 is part of your panel. So CD38 you need to have. CD58 you can have. If you are using 13 color, you can use include CD81 or uh, CD86. But mandatory, if you ask me, CD73, pure MRD marker, CD73, CD58 is very important. You can use uh, the other marker, which I would suggest is 304, you can use. Yeah, pure MRD markers, these three, good. Still, you have space, you can include CD86, more the merrier. Okay, is there any absolute blast ground criteria for flow? I see there is no criteria for flow. It's all like... Uh, uh, by experience, you can't just, then nobody has put a guideline saying like uh, the absolute blast count should be so much, then only you can do flow. As I said, you uh, if you can able to, if the, if when you're acquiring, if that particular blast forms a cluster, cluster of say some events in diagnostic, then you can do flow, no problem. When you're running flow, if they are not uh, producing a cluster and if the events are just sprayed around, you cannot gate and you cannot uh, uh, see the expression of markers. So that is the only reason. I have done 2% um, blast when the total count is 7,000. I have done flow. I have got the diagnosis. I, I can able to 
but acute leukemia diagnosis of you need 20% plus right so most of the times uh, you will be having no problem in doing flow in peripheral blood only when it is uh, pancytopenic you suggest the marrow marrow will be done and you can do flow only very rarely you will be pushed to such a condition where you need to do uh, uh, flow with the peripheral blood blast percentage of 3 or 4% and total count of very low so i suppose yes, you can do any other doubts doubts come on ask your doubts if you are not understanding also you ask something i'll tell no problem some basic doubt you have don't think see the discussion is going in a different level what if i'm going to ask this basic doubt don't bother about others if you have any basic doubt also you please ask that's what i am saying now so when we discuss to very high level some basics we don't i will tell you that the region and gate tomorrow when i am doing a live analysis somebody please remind me uh, sir uh, can you explain about the leukemic stem cell uh, 34% shall we see that in aml because leukemic stem cell is something to do with aml now bll if i'm going to tell you i don't mind like saying you leukemic stem cell is a cell see it's not leukemic stem cells it's stem cells stem cells are population which is cd34 positive and 38 dim or negative okay the problem with that is some amount of when the leukemia is there it will have this phenotype that is leukemic leukemic cells abnormal leukemic cells which will be 34 positive and 38 negative this particular population are chemo resistant okay so when you give chemotherapy all the myeloid blast will be all the aml blast will be killed except this leukemic reserve stem cell reserve which can expand again to form acute leukemia so that is about acute leukemic uh, leukemic stem cell so you have some markers to differentiate between normal stem cells and leukemic stem cells like cd45 ra cd123 uh, tim3 cll1 something see that is all too much deeper so i doing aml if you want i can tell you that any other doubts yeah there is a message in our chat box clear oh great thanks doctor any other doubts someone who is hesitating to ask please ask or you put type it in the chat box so no doubts i'll take up fine so let's go now how do you do the analysis so as i said you there is some universal plots like time plot which will show you stable acquisition there is no problem with your lasers there is no problem with your fluidics then you see the forward scatter side scatter eliminate the population which is showing low forward scatter and low side scatter then you put the singlet gate okay so you select only the singlets and you will just avoid the doublets then the fourth gate is a very important gate that is side scatter cd45 very important gate with that now you see you search for this population cd45 from this particular moderate area to the negative area completely you search okay look for blast gate for any population cluster you see here the population has cluster this is a density plot and you see there is a cluster of population lying exactly in this blast gate you get them so see this is called region selecting this population see even i used to say this words uh, interchangeably but it's not right when i'm drawing this particular selecting this population this is called drawing a region this is called region when i applying this plot in the subsequent plot when i applying this particular population in a subsequent plot then it means like i'm gating this population that is called gating okay basic uh, people who have attended basic flow cytometry should know this okay so then after selecting this region gate this population in cyto cd3 or mpo or cd19 and identify the lineage okay identify the lineage tomorrow i'll be showing you live how to analyze acute leukemia okay so don't worry so then you find the lineage after finding say for example this particular class population is expressing cd19 cd10 uh, variable cd20 and uh, cd22 is dim positive it is negative for cyto cd3 it is negative for cytoplasmic mpo then i am sure it is b acute lymphoblastic i mean it's a it's a blast with b, b lineage then you refine the blast okay refine the blast and check the expression of other markers that laip that is leukemia associated immunophenotype so you see the expression of other markers like uh, how is the expression of cd38 how is the expression of cd73 how is the expression of uh, cd10 how is the expression of 13 33 in b b lymphoid blast so then that will give you information about the leukemia associated immunophenotype and then finally now when i'm using this words moderate bright dim i suppose some people i explained this in the first class itself again i'm explaining you see what is 
moderate what is bright i'll tell you so i have two popular two internal controls here normal internal controls which is uh, so since it's cd19 has been selected as example this is normal b cells this is normal t cells okay now let me show you where all the blast lies so if the blast is lying in this area completely near the t cells that is cd negative population this is negative for cd19 if the blast is lying with the b cells normal b cells then it is cd19 moderate positive okay moderate positive when the blast is lying beyond uh, the normal b cell that is it is expressing cd19 more than normal b cells then it means it is cd19 bright when the blast is in between the negative and the positive population it means it's cd19 dim when the blast is expressing cd19 in this fashion from it which is tra uh, trailing from negative to positive area it is called variable or heterogeneous expression okay then the blast is seen in two subsets one in the negative area one in the dim area it's called partial expression of cd19 in a dim fashion okay so that's why we need to interpret the markers there is one more way uh, which is very uh, like tough uh, like if you want i can share that but uh, this is more easy and reproducible okay now someone tell me like here is the blast typically this is the normal lymphocytes and you find the 40% uh, population lying in the blast region okay when i select this blast region and gate it on cd19 now i'm using the word gating okay so i'm selecting the blast region and gating this population gating this population on cd19 which is tdt i can see this population lying here so what is the expression of cd19 here what is the expression of cd19 here Positive. Bright. Positive. Bright. Bright. You should not use positive. Now you are in advanced. You should say the intensity. Bright positive. Bright. Bright positive. Because you have normal B cells here. The 19 expression is beyond the normal B cells. So it is CD19 bright positive. Okay. So now you are you, you are one step ahead. Now rather than saying positive or negative. Now you need to comment on the insert. If it is positive, you need to comment on the intensity of positiveness. Okay. TDT you can say positive because you don't have an internal control yet you can say positive positive see for tdt it matters if you say positive or negative right so tdt you can say positive cd10 what is the expression right I, how come you say right uh, sir it is extending from uh, no 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 you are seeing cd20 cd10 cd10 y axis it is positive uh, it in a moderate fashion moderate fashion Okay, bright, I would expect it here. Of course, I completely take your point. I, there is no internal Variable control. Variable or heterogeneous? No, it's not. 20 is heterogeneous, sorry. Ah, 20 is heterogeneous. 20 starts from the negative area and goes to the positive area. It is heterogeneous or variable. CD10 is moderate. If it is false here, I would call it as dim. If it falls here, it's, I call it as bright. But still... What is the internal control for? What is there is no, no internal control. I have no internal control. But still, if it is dim, it should fall here. No internal control, but still by, by, by it's mostly more like moderate, most likely moderate. I can cannot we be... use uh, internal control across cells, like the grants can be internal control Correct. for blood? Very true. Yes, of course, why not? See, but the grants has a problem of showing autofluorescence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is a bit problematic, but still you can use it. Uh, see, once this is all beginning, once you start seeing plots again and again, then you by uh, by experience you can tell okay but if hematogons are there better select hematogons as your internal control than your uh, grants the problem with grants is that they can show water flows because they have granules right that's a problem okay so, so cd20 uh, when we are saying it is heterogeneous uh, should hmm. we say it is dim to moderate or heterogeneous sorry 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 sir come again please cd20 when we are saying it's heterogeneous positivity Mm. So, should we comment on whether it is dim to moderate like that or only heterogeneous? Ah, yes. super. Very good. See, when you say heterogeneous means it's fine. Uh, sometimes some people do that. They say like uh, negative uh, to positive, negative to bright. When this same population is extending till here, then you can say ne negative to bright, but you can just say heterogeneous. That's it. See, you are basically giving the expression how the markers are behaving. That's it. So, uh, you need not say that. I would say not uh, not needed. But if you want to say heterogeneous in brackets, you want to say it's trailing from negative to bright, you can put it in brackets. But I would say heterogeneous, that's what fine. That will do the job for me. 
see I'll, I'll show you some uh, so this is done right so let's go for so again now classification of uh, BALL now currently WHO we are not doing this but previously by uh, European uh, group we were doing this classification right we have uh, based on the maturation itself so pro BALL Kala positive BLL or common BLL, then pre BLL and mature BLL and other form. So, this is how the markers expression changes. So, you find CD19 is a absolute B cell marker. It is completely expressed from the pro to the mature B uh, thing. Whereas CD10, as I said, you know, I showed you an example uh, this uh, pro BLL. CD10 will not be positive. CD10 will be starting from common BLL. So, CD10 is here. IgM will be expressed only in the pre B. Okay, so with these markers, you can say whether it's a pro BLL or a color positive BLL or a pre BLL. So I showed you some plots in the earlier class. Now also I'll show you. And again, same same thing. I'm just showing you. So pro BLL will be CD34 positive, TDT positive, CD10 negative. That is very important. CD10 negative, CD19 is positive, 22 positive, so and so so and so. Pre B and this color positive will be CD10 positive, 19 positive, and so and pre BLL will be cytoplasmic IgM positivity okay now this is a typical case of let's analyze it. so we have a population falling in the blast gate correct lymphocytes are here this is the blast gate so a red color population is forming a cluster in the blast gate when I select this region and I'm applicating in this particular plot I can see that CD9 this particular population is positive for CD19 okay so it is negative for CD10 it is positive for CD34. With these two plots, can I say it's BALL? Can I? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, see, as per the criteria, uh, if 19 is bright, you need to have one more additional markers. Here, 10 is, if it's positive, you can say. If 10 is negative, no? So, you can rely on one more marker somewhere around. Uh, I have not shown that, right? So, I would allow to see CD22 or cytoplasmic CD1798. If that is showing something positivity, I would give it as BL. Okay. I'm not shown that. Sorry. So I should have shown that basically. So it is 38 positive, 34 positive. Assuming now CD22 is positive and cyto 79 is positive. Okay. Now HLADR is positive. 15 is expressed in a variable fashion. From negative, it goes to positive area. This is normal neutrophils as controls. And NG2 is slight dim positive. Okay. Now this is a classic case of pro BL. And when CD10 negative BLL is expressing CD15, see now 15 is a myeloid marker. It's a myeloid marker. It's a myeloid associated marker and not a myeloid specific marker like MPO. Now I would sign this report as BLL with aberrant CD15 likely to be MLL rearranged BLL. So when you are a pro flow cytometry analyst reporting a pro BLL, then you need to report like this. You need to tell it is a BA, CD10 negative BALL, okay, with apparently expressing CD15, likely to be MLL gene rearranged or KMT2 gene rearranged. And one more supporting evidence is this is called some markers which can predict the cytogenetics. Okay, I told you about this uh, uh, TSLPR, right, or CRLF2 for pH like NG2 positivity is more likely seen in MLL or KMT2A. Okay, so this is a typical case of pro BLL. Pro BLL is BLL with CD10 negativity. It should be CD19 positive, it should be 79A or CD22 positive, and 10 is typically negative. And when pro BLL is apparently expressing CD15 and or MG2 expression is seen, it is more likely KMT2A rearranged. Now let's go for the second case. We have seen this already in the last class, but still I want to reinforce. So you find here the lymphocytes, monocyte. You have small population of basophils, you find neutrophils and granulocytes here and you find the blast here which is from the dim to likely extending up to the negative area. Most of the BLL blast will fall in like this. I show you, showed you some schematic uh, representation uh, some time back. It falls from the dim to negative area. So once I select this blast region and I get it up on 19 and 45, you find this blast is precursor population or abnormal population is 19 positive. Uh, more likely in a dim to moderate fashion. It is CD10 positive, moderate. HLDR is positive. It is negative for CD20. It is negative for cytoplasmic IgM. So cytoplasmic IgM is not expressed. So it's not pre BAL. Now 10 is positive. So it's not pro BAL. So it's most likely a color positive BAL. 
But this is another case where now a similar blast trailing here, the predominant blast is falling in the negative region. Only a small trailing population falls in the CD45 dim region. Okay, and you get this blast C for expression of 19, 19 is positive, 10 is slightly down. When you compare to this 10, now see the expression of 10 here. It's slightly down. See, 10 is here in the y axis. You see the expression of 10 here, and you see the expression of 10 which is in the x axis. It's slightly lower, or you see here, this is beautiful. It's slightly lower. It's like uh, dim positive. Okay, CD10 is dim positive, 19 is moderate positive, uh, see, and it's cytoplasmic IgM positivity. And this is definitely not pro B or Kala positive because IgM is expressed. So this is pre B area. Okay, so one more beautiful advantage of doing flow is you can also do ploidy analysis by flow cytometry. How do you do this? I'll show you now. So now you get the blast. Okay, you get the blast. Okay, after getting the blast, you also get the lymphocytes. There is a marker called FX cycle violet. Okay, like a, a propidium iodide DNA binding dyes. Okay, there is something called FX cycle violet. Okay, so you use that marker along with some gating markers like CD19, 10, uh, 45, etc. So what you need to do, you need to gate the blast or uh, select the blast. And similarly, you need to select the lymphocytes. Then now you need to see how this FX cycle violet, which is the DNA binding dye, is expressed in lymphocytes and how it is expressed in blast. Then you divide the FX cycle uh, intensity by in blast divided by FX cycle intensity in lymphocytes. If it is a diploid blast, it will be one because lymphocytes and blast are having same set of same number of chromosomes. So the DNA binding will be same. If the blast is hyper diploid, then when you divide the intensity of FX cycle violet by FX cycle of blast divided by FX cycle uh, expression of in lymphocytes, it will the, the value will be more than 1.06. Okay, 1.06. This you need to define this criteria in your lab. But the point here is if it is greater than 1, it is hyper deployed. If it is 1, it is deployed. If it is less than 1, it is hypo deployed. Because uh, we are using control here as lymphocytes, which is 2N. If the blast is also 2N, it will be 1. If the blast is showing more than 2N chromosomes, then the uh, but, uh, DNA binding will be more and this particular uh, uh, expression intensity will be more. So you will have more than 1. If it is hypoploid, hypo, hypoploidy blast, then what happens? The blast will have less chromosomes. It will not. It will be less than 2N. So the DNA binding, uh, the bind, that is, this dye will bind to the nucleus, but in a less fashion compared to normal uh, when compared to the normal lymphocyte. So it will be less than. So it is hypoploidy. So that's how you can say ploidy by lymphocytes. Now you see here, this is blast. This is lymphocytes. This is hypoploidy very rare but haploid okay you find here the blast or the lymphocytes are overlapping each other this is diploid okay and you see here again the blast is slightly above the, the effect cycle uh, violet dye is expressed in the blast more than slightly more than lymphocytes so it is likely hyper diploid but in a low when you find a good separation between it becomes high hyper diploid but basically what you need to say by flow is whether it is diploid hyper diploid or hypoploidy so that is what prognosis counts. This is too much. And again, this is how you get it. See, you get the blast, you get the lymphocytes. So you get the blast, you get the lymphocytes. See the expression of FX cycle violet and then divide the expression in blast divided by the expression in lymphocytes. Greater than one, hyper diploid. One diploid, lower than one, it is hyper diploid. Okay. So as I said, flow can also help in predicting the genetic. Okay. So, so I said you KFT 2A. 10 is negative. 15 apparently seen, it is KMT2 a rearranged. If it is BALL blast expressing 13, 33, 25, likely to be pH positive ALL. Okay, flow can help you to say whether it's pH positive ALL. Similarly, uh, when uh, 19 is positive, 10 is positive, 34 is positive, the, some markers are expressed low and 13 expression is seen, it can be ETV run X1. Okay, similarly, if it's a pre BALL with strong 9 expression, it can be TCF3 PBX1. So BCR ABL1, like I said, you TSLPR is positive in a subset of BCR ABL1 thing. But again, you need to have the marker inside. So flow can help you to predict genetic abnormalities. Having all said that, 
still you need to do a cytogenetics to confirm you with only with flow you cannot take the guy it's expressing 1333 should be likely phcll and you can't start treating you again need to confirm it with uh, fish okay so risk stratification i said you again ph positive all as a bad prognosis ph like all as a very relatively bad prognosis mll rearranged as a bad prognosis hypoploidy has a poorer prognosis hyperploidy has a better prognosis so it also helps in risk stratification to a bit okay but however as i said you has to be confirmed by fish so how do you report uh, leukemia I mean bll report so these are all small thing and this will be repeating in the next lectures also the name the type of instrument or the software you use the cell preparation technique and the processing method you have used whether it's a stainless wash or light stain wash what was the sample used antibodies used in the assay so you need to tell what all antibodies you can't just say like without telling antibodies what you used you can't say it's bll you need to tell what all antibodies you have used how many humans you have acquired if it's diagnostic as i said you it should be 50000 to 1 lakh if it is mrd it should be 1.5 million okay and uh, lod lok you will see in mrd gating strategy site scatter versus cd45 then site scatter versus cd19 so what is the gating strategy you have used so you have to interpret the markers positive or negative if it is positive you need to comment on the intensity final impression should clearly stated along with differential diagnosis you also need to tell what are the other necessary tests that has to be done like fish or something i'll show you some model reports so this is how you need to interpret the markers okay so you have the markers here this is optional uh, but now still we are doing but still uh, uh, it is absolutely optional but what matters most is intensity what is the intensity of that is it a bal you see cd19 moderate expression 10 moderate expression 22 dim expression it is negative for surface igm negative for cd20 okay most likely yeah color positive color positive yeah so what matters to me is this if you give this fine no problem more the merrier again but when you are reporting this intensity should be there when you see a flow report only reporting percentages and not the intensity then that's not a good flow report intensity of the markers are very important than percentages if you give both it's fine okay now uh, this is another report where as i said you percentages are not given much importance but still they have told about the expression of markers so now you see this is a case where the blast is expressing 19 and 10 it is expressing 22 in a dim fashion again 17 and 8 in a dim fashion 38 is positive 58 is moderate positive 81 again showing the plot with internal controls will make more sense okay see uh, dim is 1 2 3 and 86 heterogeneous is 34 38 and 33 so again it's a consistent with bl okay so these all things has to be done okay so tomorrow we'll be seeing live analysis so we'll have some files i got some files from the participants so we'll do it tomorrow how to go in a sequential basis how to start from the beginning and how do we get and see okay any doubts that perhaps has some questions so okay um let me go from back cytoplasmic av chain you can be seen on flow do we do it routinely you can do cytoplasmic igm routinely yes i do cytoplasmic igm routinely Uh, it's up to you whether you want to some people are not doing it cytoplasmic igm i combine it with my ddt so i do it and i i can able to give a color pos differentiate between a color positive and a pre bln but if you ask me is it so important to do that not maybe not but still i am doing it in effect cycle which peak of blast to take graph for showing two peak see that's a case with two 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 uh, one set of blast were hyper deployed and one set of blast were deployed that's abnormal normally in most 99% cases you will get only one peak you need to take that peak only sir please show the internal control graph so that i can understand better dr anand for which case you are asking this dr anand you are there internal control graph uh, i suppose i have shown uh, but some cases if internals are not there tomorrow i'll show you tomorrow when you have internal control will be there i can get and show you so please elaborate more about internal control example internal control for cd10 okay cd10 internal control is neutrophils hnidr internal control is b cells normal b cells monocytes those are all normal internal controls for cd58 internal control is neutrophil what else CD19, you know, B cells, 20 B cells, 22 B cells, 13, 33, 15 myeloid cells, neutrophils, 117 mast cell in the marrow. 
that is an internal control. 34 in normal internal control is normal myeloid blast or hematogons, which are normal B cell precursors. T cell for all T cell markers. Yeah. Sir, is there any absolute low and high cutoff of blast gate at X axis? Is there any absolute low or high cutoff? No, there is no cutoff for blast gate. See, but I tell you, you always don't blast gate. I explain because you should know what is a blast region. But you scrutinize all the population which is in the fortified negative area anywhere from from the lymphocytes. From the lymphocytes, any anything when CD fortified is in the x-axis, anything in the left of lymphocytes has to be scrutinized. Let it be basophils, PDC, or anything. You need to prove it should be. Uh, it should uh, unless or otherwise proved, everything has to be scrutinized. To eliminate debris in forward scatter, side scatter plot, do we use packeting from FSC-SSC? How to put threshold of debris? <laughs> See, threshold, you can do it uh, by a setting, but every time you cannot adjust the threshold. So, you can use forward scatter, side scatter to take only the population from the lymphocytes and eliminate the debris. Packeting from FSC-SSC. I didn't get that. So, there's some more questions. I'll take that. Uh, what is packeting? Okay. Right. Back gating. Back gating uh, basics. I'll be telling you later, but still I'll tell you. Back gating is something like, see, uh, normally you go for a sequential hierarchical gating. Starting from, as uh, someone asked, forward scatter, side scatter, select the population, then you go for uh, side scatter CD45. Then in CD45, you select the CD45 team blast population. Then you go for 1910. Uh, you go in that way, right? Finally, once you find the blast, you want to see how the blast is expressed in forward scatter, side scatter. Then you select the blast and apply it forward scatter, side scatter. So that is called back gating. So to make it very simple, normally we from the scatter properties, you go to fluorescent properties, markers. If from markers, if you go back to the scatter properties or any previous markers you used for gating, that is called back gating. So the opposite of going sequential is, as I said to you, from forward scatter, side scatter, then side, uh, side scatter CD45, then get that C for expression of 1910, and then you go over like that. Back gating is once you finalize the, you have isolated the blast and you want to see how the blast is seen in forward scatter, side scatter alone. Then that is and applying that particular population in forward scatter, side scatter uh, plots is called back gating. So opposite, going front, back is coming back the other way. Is that okay, doctor? You understood? Any other doubts? You can unmute yourself and you can ask. I have one more question. Thank you. Thanks for the excellent discussion. Thank you. See, um, uh, see, lectures are a bit lengthy and I cannot avoid anything. Um, at least it takes two hours, but I cannot cut short anything. Uh, my point is, I need to finish it off. You have the liberty and luxury to see the recorded version also, so that uh, I don't want to skip anything. And that's the reason why I'm not compromising on the time. So let it be two hours. I'm finishing it off. Any doubts, you can push me a message uh, or in the group. If you put it in the group, others can also learn. So thank you and uh, good night.